if you can't preach after that, you can't preach. <laughs> wow, how wonderful. Well, this is my last 20 minutes with you, and we want to make it count so much. Let me ask you, why do you think the Lord did not tell us to make disciples until after the resurrection? He never mentioned it during his entire ministry until the very, very end. The last two times that he appeared and was with fellow believers, 500 of them, during the seven times he appeared. And it was on those last two occasions that he finally said, go make disciples of all the nations. He'd never said it before. Now listen closely. If there's a great coach or a great general, they will all wait until just before the battle or just before the competition. And then they will give their most important instruction to those who are going out either to fight or in sports to compete. Are you with me so far? Why? So the team will not forget it. They want it on your mind, on your heart, as a general or as a coach. And our Lord did the exact same thing. He modeled disciple-making for us for the entire three and a half years, basically, of his ministry, especially the last two and a half. And you see it vividly, and Robert Coleman points it out in the Master Plan of Evangelism. But he didn't tell us to do it until the very end. Now, who do we need to help us do it right? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit had not yet come to indwell us permanently until after Jesus had been glorified and gone back to the Father. And the Lord spoke to us about it. He said, and the Holy Spirit has been with you, but he will be in you. Now what's the difference? The Lord had anointed Old Testament prophets and godly men and women down across the centuries. But he never indwelt us until after Pentecost. And so it is that when the disciples waited for the coming of the Spirit and were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were enabled to minister in the power that Jesus wanted them to have. So, do we have the indwelling Christ in us? The answer is an overwhelming yes. Amen? He lives in our hearts from the day that you invited him in and the power of his spirit is right with us. And Jesus said this. He said, there will be times when you'll call, be called before uh, authorities because of your faith in me. You'll suffer some because of your faith in me. But he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. For in the hour that you need it, it will be given to you. This is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10. It will be given to you. For it will not be you who is speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. This is why we don't need to be afraid to witness. And this is the reason why if you've never equipped a disciple and you say, I don't know how, we're going to show you how in your small group. You'll learn. And the materials will be worth about 20% of the experience. 80% of it will be the Holy Spirit working through you, using the gifts that God has given you, the love He's given you, and the experience that He's given you, so that you're able to walk with a new believer, or not just a new believer, but a growing believer, and disciple them. So you don't have to be afraid. He will work through you to do it. Now, Jesus said, and this is an interesting verse. One day I was, uh, it was early in the morning and I got a phone call. I was a seminary student at the time, so I was very young. 
and uh, a, a very famous pastor in Texas uh, named Johnny Bisano had asked me if I would disciple one of the members of his church. So I did it as a favor to Brother John. And the young man I was discipling was an attorney. He was a young lawyer, very smart. And he called me, and I got him in his quiet time, got him started, and he called me and said, Billy, I found a verse. Um, it's um, 14th chapter of John, verse 12. He said, I don't understand it. Jesus said, and greater things will you do in my name than I have done because I'm going to my Father. Now, did you hear that? Greater things will you, believers, do in my name than I have done because I'm going to my Father. And, and Bill said, Billy, how in the world would we ever, as sinners saved by grace, ever do anything greater than our Lord? Well, I can tell you this. We pastors and preachers will never preach a sermon better than the Sermon on the Mount. How many of y'all would agree with that? No way. And we're never going to do or be the instrument that God uses to do something more miraculous than raise Lazarus from the dead. Everybody agree with that one? Y'all are not very... Do you agree? Okay. Now, and our character... No way. We will never have the character of our Lord. He was perfect and sinless. And we're sinners saved by grace. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now, then what in the world are we going to do that Jesus said is greater than what he did? I think I know. But it'll be heaven before I'm sure. But I'm going to tell you about it. The Lord's ministry was brief. Uh, my first pastor, I was 19 years old. I'm now 73. Jesus' ministry was only three and a half years. So he didn't have the chance to win many people to faith, nor did he have the chance to disciple many people. He discipled 12, and 11 of them were successful. His ministry was brief and deep. But, uh, but we have the opportunity to live longer, most of us, than 33 years. Are you with me so far? When he said greater things, he didn't mean quality. He was talking about quantity. Let it sink in. Greater quantitative things will you do in my name than I have done. I've been with Dr. Graham on nights when we had 6,000 people come forward in Berlin. One night, one service, to give their hearts and lives to Christ. Our Lord never had a night like that. He never saw hundreds of people coming to faith on any day in his ministry. Quantitatively, we have seen Dwight L. Moody's done it. Sunday, I can go down through the list. Charles Finney, Wesley, they have all seen greater numbers than our Lord saw. And disciple making, Jesus had a short time to train his disciples. Now, the chairman of our board is here with me, who is one of my dearest, deepest friends, Bradley Martin. I led badly to Christ over 50 years ago, never dreaming that he would become the chairman of our board and ministry when he's been chairman for over a decade now. When we are blessed to live longer lives, we can disciple more than our Lord did, strictly because we're living longer and have the opportunity. Does that make sense now? Okay. Now, for you to do it, one of the things I like to train the men that I disciple is carry in your pocket, and ladies do it in your purse, a booklet, and Andrew Lucen has shown us this wonderful card 
that's so succinct and clear, and you can do the same thing. You can carry it in your pocket. But through the years, I've carried uh, Steps to Peace with God, which is over half billion in print, over 500 million in print, in 26 languages. I carry it in my pocket in Spanish when I'm in Texas and in English because we have many, many people that speak Spanish in Texas and that's their heart language. And that way I can witness to them and give it to them in Spanish, others in English. And we have it in Thai, we have it in many languages. So a quick closing story with my moments that I have. I was supposed to go to Thailand to preach at the CCT annual conference about five years ago. And that they're Presbyterians, what CCT means. So they were so kind to ask me to come and do that. And they have about 500 pastors and I was gonna to minister to them. So I prayed about it, the Lord said go. And I was just flying all the way to Thailand for one day and flying back to Texas. It's a long way. So the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Billy, I want you to pray and I want you to get all of your prayer partners to pray. And we had about 1,700 prayer partners at that time. So I sent them an email and said, please pray about the seat where I'm supposed to sit on the airplane. I'm to pray that whoever is searching for God on the airplane would find me so that I can talk with them about the Savior. All right? Whoever is searching for God would find me. Okay, I get on the flight. I'm headed for, um, from Chicago to, um, let's see, to Hong Kong, change planes to go to Bangkok and then to Chiang Mai. So that's a 16 hour flight. It was early in the morning. I, I was tired because I'd already made a flight to get there and the weather had been bad. So I was a little sleepy. I got, um, they seated me. I didn't choose the seat. I left that to the Holy Spirit. They put me in a seat on the aisle, which is perfect. I closed my eyes to go to sleep. I hadn't been asleep any time. When you have your eyes closed and somebody comes up next to you, can you feel it? Yep. And I felt a presence. Somebody was standing next to me. I didn't know who. And I say standing. It, they weren't standing. They, were, they had knelt down on their knees and they were at the same level that I was. And it was the stewardess, one of the stewardesses on the flight. And uh, the, I had a free ticket and they put me in business class, which was really nice of them. So when I felt this presence, I opened my eyes and turned to the right. Well, goodness, the lady's face was here. I turned my face and I thought, gosh, I'm glad Carol Ann isn't with me. You know, it was a little scary. So I, I kind of went like this and uh, I spoke to her softly and I said, can I, can I help you? Now she's the flight attendant and she had a little dot, you know, right here. And she said, sir, I'm searching for God. Can you help me find him? Those are the exact words out of her mouth. So I said, yes, ma'am. But do you know why you're asking me that question? She said, because I'm lonely empty inside and something's wrong in my life and I know that I need God. I said, I believe that. But let me tell you that I had 1,700 Christian friends praying about the seat I was to sit in the airplane and they're all praying that whoever is searching for God would find me so I could talk with them. And that's why you're here asking me that question. Well, tears began to come down her cheeks. And I said, you're Hindu. She said, yes. I said, okay. I turned to the cross, which is in the middle of the little booklet. And I said, do you know what happened here? She said, no, but I've always wanted to understand the cross and Christianity. What does that cross mean? I said, well, now listen closely. I said, God in love sent his son to die on that cross. 
And he created enough good karma for the whole world, and we Christians call good karma grace. And I said, and he paid for all the bad karma in the world, and we Christians call bad karma sin. Are y'all following? She said, oh, is that what it means? She said, I've never understood this before. I said, well, that's exactly what it means. I said, now you believe in reincarnation, right? She said, yes. I said, well, I've got good news for you. When Jesus Christ paid for all the bad sin, the karma, bad karma sin, you don't have to come back anymore. In fact, you won't. You'll not be coming back to have to earn enough good karma to pay for the bad karma so that you can eventually go to heaven. She said, now let me get this right. He paid for all my bad karma? I said, every bit of it. She said, that's the best news I've ever heard in my life. And she said, what do I do next? I said, you open the door of your heart and received his gift of forgiveness and love and make him your savior. She said, how do you do it? I said, through prayer. She said, would you teach me how to pray? I said, sure. So I led her in prayer. She gave her heart to the Lord and she got up tears of joy. Her eyes changed. And I thought, hallelujah, the Lord's answered my prayer. I can go to sleep too now. So I closed my eyes. Okay. I have three minutes. I need every bit of it. I closed my eyes again. Whoa, I felt another presence. I opened my eyes, sure enough, another flight attendant kneeling down by me, and she said, I'm Buddhist. And she said, my life is in a whole lot worse shape than my friend who's Hindu. And she said, she just told me that she gave her life to Jesus Christ and that you showed her about how bad karma could be forgiven and erased. I said, yes, I'll show you too, because you both believe in reincarnation, and you both, Buddhism and Hinduism, believe in karma. So she also gave her heart to the Lord. Then I closed my eyes to go to sleep. No, nope. A third attendant, the flight attendant supervisor, was knelt down. She said, I'm Roman Catholic, and I don't feel like my prayers are going above the ceiling of the plane. The Buddhist lady and the Hindu lady told me they've both become Christians and given their life to Jesus Christ. She said, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the death of Christ and his burial. Everything. But there's something missing. I said, oh, I can tell you exactly what's missing. I said, could you get me a, a, a cup of water? And she brought me the water. I said, all right. Do you believe this is H2O, that this is water? She said, yes, I do. Of course, I brought it to you. I said, okay. Could I die of thirst holding that cup of water if I never put it to my lips and swallowed the water and drank it? She thought about it for a few minutes. She said, you know, you could. I said, well, you're in that situation. You believe all the right things, but you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord. So I took her to Romans 10, 9, and 10 and showed her what the Apostle Paul said. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And she said, oh, I get it. I, she said, it's application. I said, yes. He said, behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. And, I, and he said, if anyone will open the door, I'll come in with, into him. And so she said, I want to do that. I need to do that. I said, okay, we'll pray together and do it. She also gave her heart to the Lord. And then all three ladies came to my seat and said, it's time for you to sleep. So I slept for six hours. When I woke up, all three ladies came again. They said, bring your briefcase to first class. We have told the captain that we've become Christians and what we did, and he's making you an honor, honorary crewman, crew member of Cathay Pacific. 
and you fly first class now. <laughs> and when we got to Hong Kong, he said, don't go off with the, uh, all the people that are tourists that are flying on the plane. You're a staff member now, you come off with us. And they took me to their private place where all the pilots were and the flight attendants. And we had a fabulous time before I flew on to Bangkok. Now, was that an accident? No. That's the Holy Spirit working in answer to prayer. Now, before I leave, every morning when you get up during 2018, start your morning with prayer. Amen? Read the scriptures, even if it's only a few verses, but read them every morning. Feed your heart. And pray, Lord, whoever needs you, who's searching for you in the city of Manila, let them find me. And if they can't find me, lead me to them. Now, grandmother always taught me, if you pray for rain, carry an umbrella. Did you get it? If you pray for rain, carry an umbrella. Now, if you pray for the chance to witness, take some booklets. You're going to have some in your bag. And you can use some of these little cards, too, just the same. And put them in your pocket so that you can share your faith with that person that needs it. Bless you. Now, we have boxes for you to put these in. Pastors, take your blue page to the registration desk that's right outside, and we'll give you a CD so that you'll have everything Randy Craig has said. And I have a sermon or two on there on disciple making you want to, might want to listen to, and you preach it, okay? Bless you, and thank you for the wonderful privilege of being with you.